my name is Matt Bohannon and I am a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. Currently work in the substance use treatment field, helping other individuals get sober um, and seek treatment that they deserve. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life and recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people. People, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense I'm proud to say that I recover loud I never thought I could but I'm so proud that I discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny I needed recovery I still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. I recover loud here to tell my own story I recover proud save a life of like 40 I recover loud yeah I recover loud I recover Hi, welcome to this episode of Recover Loud. I'm your host, Mike Paddleford, and I recover loud. This week I'm sitting down with uh, my guest, Matt Bohannon, uh, from Manchester, New Hampshire. Yes. Um, Matt, welcome to the show. You've got some great experience, uh, both in um, you know your own personal recovery and, and now you're working in the field. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, you know, what it was like for you growing up, uh, what what kind of childhood did you have? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm from Attleboro, Massachusetts. Um, I grew up with a loving mom and dad, normal household. I have an older brother who's about nine years older than me. Um, so, you know, there was, you know, some tension there because we're at two totally different spans in our life. And, you know, our parents provided us the best life they could for us possible. Um, but we shared a small bedroom, you know, growing up. So we're always on top of each other. And I'm always trying to get attention from others because I feel like I don't belong, right? Um, I, you know, remember from a really young age, um, I would never get my way and to show that I would show aggression, right? That's how it kind of all started. Um, I have scars right here. I punched my arm through a glass plate window. I'm pretty sure because my mom told me that I couldn't have something to eat that I wanted, <laughs> <laughs> causing destruction anywhere. And that was at a really young age. Um, and I really struggled with feeling less than my whole life, you know, from probably 10 years old was where I really started to feel that way. And then all the way up to the, you know, 20, 21, 22, you know. And um, who was it that you felt you were less than? You, you mean who, who yeah, was I it mean, in my life that made me feel that way? I mean, yeah, I mean, it was who, really, who were you comparing yourself to? I think I was comparing myself to the other kids within schools, right? Okay. Like they had nicer clothes than I did, mm -hmm. right? Like my parents could maybe only shop at Walmart, which is nothing wrong. I shop at Walmart today, I love right. Walmart. You know what I mean? Right, now we to, see the value of it. You know, we <laughs> see the value, right? But it was like, oh, those clothes are from Walmart or Kmart back yes, then, right? right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was always comparing myself to the other kids within my neighborhood or within yeah. the school. Um, I was bullied a lot growing up. I was overweight as a kid. Um, and it really just put a strain on me trying to connect with other people, you yeah. know, my whole life. So, um, did you live, um, you know, in Massachusetts your, your entire childhood? Did you move yeah, around I, a lot? Yeah, I've always lived in Massachusetts. Um, I went, you know, I spent some time growing up in Norton, Mass, and I moved to Attleboro, and then eventually, pretty much, high school, I lived in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, and I, I grew up in Massachusetts as well, yeah. just outside of Worcester. Nice. Um, but I had, I, I had a similar upbringing, you know. Um, I had aunts and uncles that lived at the lake. Uh, we lived in an apartment. Um, I felt less than, uh, you know, most of the people uh, around. And uh, I mean, I even went so far as to tell people I was adopted into the family I was in because I, I didn't feel like, uh, it, I, w I wanted to be seen better than they were, yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, and I struggled with that, you know, quite a bit, um, you know, because I didn't want to be uh, that kid who, whose clothes got bought at Kmart, yeah, you know? And, and uh, you know, I had to get uh, husky jeans and have them hemmed, you know, because I was a short kid, um, and you know all all of that embarrassment. Uh, you know, I, I fought that, and uh, so so that's. I mean, I still struggle with that today sometimes. And I do too. You know, even as, as you know, regardless of where I am as an adult yeah. today, you know, um, and uh, it, it's a tough thing to get over. Um, is is that kind of why you started using substances? Yeah, I would say you know when I 
probably got into early high school, right? You know, I, my friends that I had at the time, right, would, you know, want to go steal the liquor from the parents' cabinet, right? Or go smoke some weed down the street, right? And I started there, like, dabbling into it because I'll do whatever you want me to do for you to like me, right? right. Like, I'm a people pleaser at heart. Even I struggle with that still today, right? I always give, give, give just so you'll like me, right? It's like, right. can I buy your happiness or can I buy your love, right? And... You know, I regret that today when you look back on it, but that's exactly what happened is I, you know, I do have some, you know, friends from high school that I still speak to today, you know, that are now in recovery or not in recovery. Yeah. Um, but that's exactly what it was. I was doing it to fit in, but because I have an addictive personality, once I'm starting that, I can't stop, you know, no matter what it is, right? It can be the alcohol, the marijuana. It can be anything, really, you know? Yeah. There's so many addictions. Shopping, you just see right. my shoes, you know? All the shoes I own. Yeah, and I mean, anything can become the addiction. Anything um, can. You know, we happen to go down the path of, of using substances, but, you know, like you said, there can be gambling, there can be, you know, sex. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of ways that we try to fill that gap. Because it's filling a void. Yeah. That's what it is, right? Yeah. It's like this big hole I have in my heart, and it's like, what can I stuff in that hole to yeah. feel better? Yeah. And that's what I did, essentially, you know what I mean? I took it and run I took it and ran with it. And then when I was like eighteen, someone's like, Oh, do you wanna try this perk five? Just bite it in half, you know, crunch crunch. That's what we called it back then, crunch crunch, right? And the minute I did that perk five, I was screwed. Yeah. I was screwed. You know what I mean? It was I have arrived, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is my aha moment, right? Yeah. And then it progressed. It wasn't perk yeah. fives, it was O C eighties, right? Yeah. It was just it kept progressing, you yeah. know, and that's where I like, that's where I hurt a lot of people in my life during yeah. that time. And, you know, it, it's a good point you made there. Um, you know, when we started doing these, it was drugs didn't seem so bad. No, not yeah. like it is today. No. no. Um, you know, it, it was, um, wow, you know, this is awesome. You yeah. know, I'm, I feel, you know, I can talk to this group of people. Exactly. I can relax. I can, you know. I can jump off this bridge. I can clean my whole apartment today. I can clean my <laughs> house, right? Stuff. Yeah, yeah you know, you know, the normal know. stuff becomes, yeah. you know. Um, so, uh, do better at work, do better at school, you know. Yeah, yeah, oh, eventually it's like. Um, eventually, no, <laughs> it's like you can't do any of that, any of that stuff anymore, right. no? Right, and um, you know, in one of the seminars today, they were talking, you know, in the beginning we start using to feel better, to do better, uh, and then in the end we have to quit so that we can feel better and we can do better, exactly. um, you know, because in the beginning, I know for me, uh, I started with a, a, an addiction to opiates uh, that were prescribed, mm -hmm. and when I got them, I could do more. Yeah. You know, I could play baseball with the kids, I could, you know, run around, I could do all that stuff, and then towards the end, uh, I couldn't do anything without, and even when I did them, yeah. you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't getting me to that point anymore. We're always um, chasing that first time. Yeah. We're always chasing that. Uh, so how long did you end up using for, do you think? I would say, you know, real heavily it would be from you know 2009 you know when i consider heavy use all the way through 2019 it's almost 10 years mm -hmm. so it started with a perk it started with a perk and ended with god it ended with a meth pipe and boofing suboxone to be honest yeah you know? yeah <laughs> i hate yeah. to admit that but it's the truth <laughs> yeah and you know that that's i appreciate you sharing that um because people have, have done things all kinds of ways and you know when they find out that you know they can identify with somebody else you know yeah. uh, we all have individual experiences that other people can experience from exactly uh, you know uh, benefit from I mean what the, the progression you, what, right what it's, you to it's that? the crazy shit it's yeah. like it's like hearing from someone else that I'm getting high with like a getting high buddy oh have you tried it like that it right. hits you ten times faster right yeah. and it's that it's in my mind it's like how can I do it cheaper and faster Right. right. What? Yeah. How is? How am I going to achieve my high cheaper and faster? And how am I going to get there quickly? Right. Yeah. And who am I going to piss off along the way? Right. Mm -hmm. It's like when you're in that addiction, no matter what it is, it's like nothing else matters. Right. right. So all you care about is me, 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 and right. the drug. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's when you start to experiment different ways. Like mm -hmm. um, there was a guy at the conference that I talked to about harm reduction. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're trying to you know teach people that there's better ways to use your substances than using needles, right? Yeah. And there's different materials that you can use, you know? And it's all about, back then, you know, 2009, you know, 2015, there wasn't all these materials you hear about, right? It's like, I would put anything in my body, you know? Yeah. No matter what the consequences could yeah. be, you know? So it's really just, addiction today is 10 times worse yeah. than it ever has been, I think, you know? And 
there's yeah, because the substances themselves have, have you know, I mean, they're hitting us different. They're they're Correct. grabbing us different. You know, yeah. um, these programs that were you know created back in the you know 40s and 50s to help with with uh, addiction, um, you know, they work great. Yeah. But when it comes to these the substances today, sometimes something extra. Harm reduction is um, you know a great a great way to you know keep people alive. Correct. Um, you know it, it doesn't have to lead anywhere, but to tomorrow. You yeah. know, people are dying on the streets from you know uh, infection, um, disease, uh, all of these other things. The overdose is only one way that we're losing you know people yeah, use drugs. Multiple, multiple you know, um, so if we can help them. Uh, you know, to do things safer um, today than, than that. Uh, obviously, there's a benefit to that. Um, you know, one thing I like to say is, you know, there's zero percent chance of recovery after a fatal overdose. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, you know, that really drills a point home. You know, we have to keep people alive. For a long time, there was so much stigma, even in my personal life, about harm reduction yeah. and, like, medicated-assisted treatment. And it's a way for someone to possibly gain insight into the recovery Absolutely. process. You know what yeah. I mean? Just because you were using ten grams of heroin yesterday, now you're down to three grams. Yeah, that, that's like a that's a that's a like let's go, dude. Like, like, exactly. Let's go, you know. Great fucking job. Yeah, great job. And yeah. some people are like, oh, well, they're still using. They're not in recovery. Maybe they're not in recovery, right? But they're on their way. And yeah. we could talk all day about like, and they're in the recovery. Are they not in recovery? Right. And but it's a start in the right direction. Well, and, and see, my my definition of recovery um, is uh, recovery is the process of change. That leads to a better tomorrow. Yep. I period. That. So there's pre-contemplation. There's contemplation. Yep. So before you're even considering quitting that substance, you know you can be there. Yeah. Um, you know when you recognize that you're having, you don't like doing this anymore. Yeah. Um, you start thinking, what can I do better? Exactly. Um, and then you start, you know, uh, getting clean supplies. Yeah. Refusing to use the puddle water. Yeah. You know these little things that can guarantee that your safety, you know, you know, a little bit more. Um, so you have a chance of, of, of living today. Yeah. Um, you know, wanting to live today. Yeah. You know, that's all part of recovery. Yeah. That's what know? it's about. <laughs> um, you know, and quitting the substance itself is is. You know, I mean, that's a great goal. Yeah. Of, my, of recovery. Um, you know, but it doesn't have to be the the end result. No. You know. Not at all. Um, so uh, while you were using, uh, you know, how how bad did it get for you? It got you know pretty bad. I would say like in the right away in between 2009 and 2011 the first like two years of like the opioid use mm -hmm. i was stealing from my friends family lying about ways to get money it was terrible you know that's yeah. the standard like a, you know addict behavior you know manipulation and lying yeah. um you know but i really struggled after my partner died he overdosed from opiates and i felt like you know this is going to be it i'm going to get better now like he died, I can't continue to get high. That's selfish. But what did I do? I got high right away. It's your. I was at his funeral. High. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean like that's that's what you knew. That's that's all I know, right? Yeah. And it, you know, my family tried to intervene. My brother and his husband they paid for a private treatment center for me to go to in upstate New York. I left that treatment center. Mm -hmm. I was homeless. You know what I mean? In New York, I had to find my way back here. I was talking to you before. I'm motivated. So if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Right? I'm determined. Yeah. And. It didn't really start to change per se, you know, until I made the decision to go to treatment. Yeah. And that's when I went to Florida, you know, and I had, my heart was set on getting better, you know. Yeah, yeah and, and you mentioned how many treatment programs? About seven. And how many did you graduate from? Seven. Yeah. Um, which, is not, which is crazy, you know what I mean? Well, seven, so, seven completed treatments, you know. So so what was it that was uh, bringing you back out after after completing the program? Um, I, you know, I've done a lot of work on myself, mm -hmm. you know, through different various ways therapy and etc and it was it's really about not having any coping mechanisms to mm -hmm. deal with life right like when yeah. shit hits the fan what am i gonna well, do but didn't you learn those in those programs you, you graduated from i went to those programs to have a place to rest my head right i didn't want to be homeless right cool. that's the truth i went to treatment yes i part of me wanted to change in my heart i did mm -hmm. but at the end of the day i didn't want to be homeless yeah the places in florida had great food to eat you know what i mean and I know how to do treatment. Yeah. Show up, I'm compliant, I'm, you know, I'm respectful. But at the end of the day, I wasn't paying attention to any of those groups, right. you know? I wasn't really trying to change and motivate myself, mm -hmm. you know? Like, 
treatment centers offer different types of modalities of treatment, right? Um, some are 12 steps, some are, you know, coping mechanisms and skills, right? But it was really about taking what I knew up here and putting it in my heart. Yeah. That's that's when the, ch the change came. Like, I can say, hi, my name's Matt, and I'm an alcoholic or an addict, right? Mm -hmm. And I can say that all day long, but I never believed it. Right. And that's right. when the change came. It's when I started to believe. Treatment is just treatment. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, like treatment is great. You know, I, I'm 100% supporter of someone going to treatment, but you also have to have some motivation for change. Absolutely. You know, you have to. Mm -hmm. Stuff. Um, we'll be right back. Uh, stick around for more of this interview with Matt. I would say like Did you have a false sense of security yeah i would say it would be a false sense of security that makes sense yeah. so like you know, i never really thought about it that way mm. but that so like they say like some people will say like recovery is not a race it's a marathon right, right. and i i'm all about like checklists and you know deadlines right so like in the beginning they'd be like did you pray and meditate today check i did that i'm right. doing it is your just bed checks up. is your bed made right yeah. yes it's made is my mm. bed made right now no, you know what I mean? That's not part, like, that's, yeah. you know, that's, it is what it is. And you know, honestly, if, if I wasn't <laughs> filming this interview in my hotel room right now, I don't know what my bed would be. Yeah, you, you know, know be, but I don't, I don't think my, my recovery is in danger today. Correct. But back then, that was a big deal. And I, and I do believe in, you know, when we're out there ripping and running, we lack, you know, we're either homeless, most times we're homeless, right? We're couch surfing, right? And I think for the first, like, good couple months, routine is good, making your bed, you know? Yeah. You know taking a shower but you are right like i think the times when the treatment didn't work it's like i completed treatment you know woohoo let's party let's celebrate right. like i can drink today because i just completed 30 yeah. days of treatment yeah i'm good yeah and that's what happens a lot like the people i know like they'll go to treatment for 30 days and then they'll come out and do one shot thinking they're good and then they're dead yeah and see you know when i went to i went to, to detox and you know got started on some boxing and then went into a, a rehab program. And after a week or so, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about drugs anymore, mm -hmm. you know? So I thought, why the hell am I gonna be here for six to nine months, yeah, you exactly, know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, I, I'm on my meds, I'm not thinking about getting high, I should, well, why am I here? Yeah. Um, and it was really about, you know, learning about myself, learning how not to use, yeah. uh, learning how to cope with other people and, you know, rely on something other than a substance that, you know, to run and hide. Uh, from the daily struggles, um, you know, but it was, um, you know, I, I had that, that clarity, uh, you know, with the medication assisted treatment that I could work on that kind of stuff, yeah. you know, um, and, and without that I didn't have it. Um, so uh, with you, when you finally went into rehab uh, this last time, yeah, you know, um, what do you think it took this last time for, for it to be working for you today? You know, so when I when I reached out for help this last time, um, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't at a bad place where I was before, right? But I knew I was getting there. And, you know, I have some really close friends that I met when I lived in Maine that really pushed me to seek treatment and to really kind of see myself, you know? But to be honest and not to be like weird, like, you know, I would be at work at my, you know, my job and I'd be in the bathroom like, for hours, right? Just like by myself, right? Trying to do like inappropriate things with drugs, right? Just yeah. to, just to get the most effect, right? Because it wasn't working anymore, yeah. and I knew that I was going to die. Like I had this yeah. burning. It was like a burning feeling in my heart, like mm -hmm. in my chest. Like I every day I woke up and I felt scared and alone, and I knew that like death was like the next option, right? So how long do you think you were fe feeling that way before you finally did something about it? I would say for a good six months. Yeah. For a good six yeah, months, I was just like, wa I was basically like a zombie in mm -hmm. my own body. You know, just walking around, you know, doing the motions. You want it to end. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, you don't want to do it yourself, but, you know, you just hope something happens. Exactly. And, um, that, and that's so kind of where it was. Like, you know, like they yeah. talk about like suicidal ideation, you know, it was like, yeah. I didn't have the balls to do anything, right. but I was so depressed and sad on the inside that like I was hoping something bad would yeah. happen to me. 
Yeah, and, and my 40th birthday was a, a changing moment for me. Uh, I woke up that morning, you know, my house was a trap house, my daughter was living there, we were, you know, uh, depriving her of, you know, necessities, food, yeah. um, that kind of stuff, and, uh, you know, I, I hated my life, you know. Yeah. And, and, of course, that morning, at 40 years old, I was broke as fuck. I couldn't even afford the next fix. And, and I, I cried, you know, I laid in bed and I cried because I never imagined my life was gonna to turn to that. Um, and to feel better, eventually, finally, I got, I got something to, to feel better. Yeah. And, uh, you know, off again. You know, I didn't feel so bad about myself. Yeah, you didn't feel so bad because you had something to feel better, right. exactly. You know? All of a so, sudden we're Superman, you know? Yeah. We're like, oh, we're, we're good now. Yeah, so. Um, I always want to. I always want to change when I'm feeling. Yeah, it's it's weird. It's like either when I'm like really high, I want to get sober, or I'm really dope, so like I want yeah. to get sober. It's like weird on both ends. Yeah, of it, you know. And you know, honestly, that's one of the the, the reasons I, I really enjoy the uh, the work. Of my Facebook group, Recovery on the Road, uh, it's a virtual recovery community center uh, where anyone can reach out at any time. That's awesome. They can be sitting at the trap house, uh, have that idea in their head, and they can connect. Um, and you know. It's no pressure, they can join the group. Nobody's jumping on them saying, you know, you need a sponsor, you need a recovery coach. Um, you know, they can just be part of a group and they can get that, you know, build that hope up. Um, and then they can reach out when they're ready. And, the opposite uh, of addiction's connection, right? Absolutely. And that's why it kept me sick for so long, is not yeah. connecting with others and running with yeah. everybody that wanted to connect. Yeah, you know, for so long. you know, and and you know that's still hard even recovery today. Um, you know, even like can, events like this, have to talk oh, yeah. to everybody all day. I'm just like, yeah, I'm nervous. You <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, and you know, this is awkward. <laughs> hundreds of people from you know uh, around you know several states. Uh, you know, Maine has a very uh, tight knit recovery community. Uh, you know, we get together and and have statewide events, and it, you know, but when I come out of Maine, and I'm meeting all of these other people, you know, but uh, it's important for me to talk to everybody because. Yeah. Your experience here in New Hampshire is totally different than ours in Maine. Yeah. Um, so you work in recovery here in New Hampshire? Yeah, that is correct. Uh, what is it you do? Um, I'm a community outreach coordinator for Live Free Recovery Services. So we are a treatment provider for substance use disorder mm -hmm. um, and offer gender specific treatment for men and women suffering from alcoholism or drug addiction. Yeah. Um, and your peer support? Yep, I'm a certified recovery support worker in the state of New Hampshire. Basically a certified recovery coach, yep. you know, through the yep. state. Um, and it was really cool when that happened because I've never been to college prior to when I'm in college now, but I was never, I've never accomplished anything. I have a GED, right? So when I took this recovery coach course and became the CRSW, yeah. I was like, wow, I can actually, I'm, I'm like smart. Yeah. Like, I'm driven. Right. Like, this is cool. Like, I can do something with my life, yeah. you know? And that was all because of this last time getting sober, right? Like, the decision that I made, like, I surrendered 100%, right? And right. I, now have so many blessings in my life today because of that, right? And I get to help others, you know? And that's the part of it, I, you know, if you can't come to treatment where I work, that's cool, I'll find somewhere for you to go to treatment. Right, you of course. Know? If we're not a good fit for you, I'll find the place that isn't good exactly. for you. And, you know, that's that's important, and I appreciate that, that you work that way because, um, you know, a lot of times we are employed by specific agencies. Correct. Yeah. Um, but we know not every agency is going to be that perfect fit. Yeah. Um, and everybody does something different. Yeah. So, um, you know, if, if they need that one specific thing, um, you know, it, it's worth it to send them there and, and, and give them that chance. Yeah, because why am I going to, you know, burden them just to fill a bed at my facility, exactly. right? Where it's going to burden the staff. They're probably either going to leave early right, they're not going or to they're going to have a reoccurrence after yeah. completing treatment because they didn't get that specific niche of treatment that they deserve. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, you know, I mean, if that's what they want, then that's what they should try. Yeah. Um, and, and having that option is, you know, really um, the best chance uh, of somebody getting getting to, uh, you know, a better tomorrow and, and being satisfied. Uh, this morning in one of the seminars, they were talking about, you know, get to that five-year mark um, and, and you're a little bit safer. But that's when... when uh, I've heard that before, too, like when you get your marbles back, whatever they yeah. call it, you know, and I believe that. Allowing someone, empowering them with the power of choice, right? Yeah. And letting them choose their destiny for recovery is what's going to actually work. We talked about this in the, when we had a phone call the other day, yeah. right? It's about being a recovery coach or a CRSW is about the power of choice for the participant or client, yeah. right? And if they make that choice, whatever that might be, MAT, sober living, rehab, detox, right? Or no treatment at all, right. they're going to feel empowered 
and they're going to take responsibility when shit does hit the fan. Absolutely. Because it was their choice. Yeah. You can't be forced into anything. Yeah. People that are forced don't change. Yeah, know? and when things don't work out, we can always say, you know, this is what you did last time. Yeah. All right, what else are you willing to try? Exactly. Um, and if you just want to try that again, you know, so be try it. it again. Yeah, try it you again. Know? As many um, times as it takes. It took me absolutely. seven times. I completed treatment seven times yeah. to find recovery, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, recovery is a journey, and um, you know, whatever that journey looks like, however long that journey takes, yeah. uh, you know, we're just gonna keep traveling. Yeah, you know? that's all we can do. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Matt, I appreciate you sharing your story. Yeah, thank uh, you. Keep up the great work. Um, yeah. You know, we need many people out there sharing their experience, and you know, bringing other people, um, you know, on this journey with us. Yeah, absolutely. So, thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Recover loud, everyone. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life in recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense i'm proud to say that i recover loud i never thought i could but i'm so proud that i discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny i needed recovery i still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. i recovered loud here to tell my own story